It has been a rough year, no matter what exchange you're in, if you're in the U.S. or Canada. Um, the NASDAQ has been down about 34%. That's, of course, an ind index that has a lot of tech on it. Uh, in fact, this will be the first year that the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average did better than NASDAQ, first year in like 10 years. So it's been a really rough ride. Uh, the actual Standard Poor's 500 is down 25%. The big thing is the Treasury yield. It's gone up two and a half points, or 250 basis points, no matter where you want to talk about it. But that's been the big deal since the beginning of the year, is higher interest rates. And I'm going to tell you that I think, personally, that a year from now, Stock prices will be higher and inflation will be lower and that'll actually bring interest rates down. I know you're supposed to be all pessimistic as an economist, but that's not what I see. And I've been doing this for 43 years. So uh, uh, next is Bitcoin. That's really worked out is um, <laughs> they, uh, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, it's, uh, it's worth, I'm trying to think, uh, nothing. That's actually what it's worth. And, um, <laughs> Oh, you buy it because you think there's a better, another sucker that's willing to pay more for it. That, that's not the way you invest. The way you invest, for instance, I, I might buy an apartment complex because I know every month I'm going to get rent checks. I'm getting something from it. If I bought uh, 100 acres of land, I could plant vegetables on it. And I know that when the harvest comes, I'm going to sell the vegetables. But this isn't that at all. Um, one thing you think about with stocks is a lot of people, a lot of people think stocks is a, like a lottery ticket or something like that. It's not. And, um, and uh, or it's just a ticker symbol, particularly my students at Tulane, they want to trade so fast and everything like that. And, uh, and we make them come up with a, um, in their research, which is at birkenroad.org, we uh, make them come up with a 12 month target price for the stock. And they are incredulous at what 12 months means. I had one student come up to me and go, 12 months? That's like three girlfriends from now. It was like, <laughs> it's like, well, I don't care about your social life. I need the damn target price on the, on the sheet. So um, then you get the, um, the Toronto Exchange uh, down 12%. And the reason is, is that um, you're much more resource heavy. And that's been pretty, uh, pretty good this year, particularly with oil. Oil's in the last couple of years, oil's been the greatest comeback since Lazarus, you know? It's, um, they, uh, I was a kind of theology finance major, so I throw those around. They, um, it's an <laughs> odd double major, but, um, let's see. obviously the resource funds are up. And then my next favorite is the Canadian Cannabis Index, which, uh, is down 73%. So all the wild stuff has really had a, had a tough time in, uh, in all of this. Um, what are we going to see for um, after COVID? What kind of things do we learn? Well, first of all, we think we'll have simpler supply chains. That's going to be great for U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Uh, they want this they want to be able to get to the product. I think one of the things that surprises people is over the last 20, 30 years, all companies have cared about is price. So if there's a little plastic part you could make here for 37 cents, and in South Korea, you can make them for 36 cents, like we're going with South Korea. And um, no more, no more. They want to be able to get to the stuff. So I think that's good for uh, both, uh, both the US and, and Canada. Um, and, but we're not sure that's going to bring more jobs. That's, I mean, not a ton more jobs, because these new plants that are being built are so efficient. Um, I, I, my boys are now 28 and 24, but when they were, um, I guess they're about 10 and 7, uh, there was a new Coca-Cola bottling plant built here, and it was, of course, the most high-tech in the country because it was the newest. And I went for a tour with my son, sons, and we go through the tour. The thing's about the size of three football fields, and they have about a six employees and the rest are robots. And so uh, we go through the tour, and then at the, ma the manager at the end uh, says to me and my sons, he goes, you know what I like about robots? They, uh, they don't have fights with their wives. They, uh, they, uh, they don't come in hungover. You know, and my kids are like, stranger danger, you know? It's, um, <laughs> so it's, uh, oh my God. It was, <laughs> it was <laughs> oh man, oh man, they, uh, let's see. Um, this is the truth. We took, take a look at stocks. This is the S&P 500, but it's true for any index. Is, um, you know, you see these problems that look so dramatic, like, uh, let's see, the Great Depression and World War I, the Korean War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, Nixon resigns, the Vietnam War, um, 18, uh, 1987 crash, September 11th, the tech boom, financial crisis, COVID-19, and they all had downsides. But when you look at them, it, they just keep going up. 
And that's the thing to remember about the markets because these stocks are getting more valuable. What you buy when you buy a stock is you buy a percentage of the company's future corporate profits. That's what it is. And with those profits, the company can do a bunch of things. They can buy back stock, which makes you have a larger percentage of the company. They can uh, reinvest it back into the company. They can use mergers and acquisitions. They can hire people. One of the surprising things to me is if you watch the financial news, all the CEOs are coming out and saying, uh, you know, it is, uh, it's going to be really bad. This recession could be a depression. Uh, I think people will be eating their young, you know, and, and, uh, and he had, what are they doing? They're buying back their own stock. They're raising dividends. They're um, doing mergers and acquisitions and hiring people. So they're really talking out of one side of their mouth. And I think what they're, you know, do as I do, not as I say, I think would be the, the rule uh, here. Um, inflation, inflation is coming down. And, uh, you know, everybody talks about how it's going to last forever and, and it's going to, you know, be 20% or so, like in some third world country or something. It's not. Nobody's noticed, but in June it was 9.1, in July it was 8.5, August it was 8.3, September was 8.2, and the new no October numbers are very low, a, dr a drop probably into the, the mid-7s. Uh, they haven't announced them yet, but that's what's happening. That's what's happening. And the idea that a lot of people say, you know, I'm going to get out of the market, and when things get better, I'll get back in. You know what? You'll never get back in. That's really the thing. And if you're waiting for somebody to, you know, you pay a high price for a cheery consensus. If you're waiting for everyone to ring a bell and go, it's time, you know, you're going to pay, pay a lot more for those stocks. And so it's, it's tough. You've always got to be swimming against the tide. And, um, you know, it's great because I know you folks as trustees all deal with math. So I can, uh, you know, sometimes I speak to a group and they, they do not. I, you know, because you know what they say. They say we're only using 20% of our brain. And every time I hear that, I think, damn, what am I doing with the other 70%? You know? So it's, um, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's rough out there. Let's see. Um, the U.S. has uh, become a science-led economic juggernaut. Uh, energy, we're using this is both, for both countries, really. Energy, we're finding more and using less. Uh, life sciences, technology. Although somehow, and I think it's worse in the U.S. than in Canada, there's a, there's a whole group of science skeptics that get all the tension. They're very loud, and they, they don't believe in climate change. They think, they think vaccinations will give you a disease. Uh, you know, the people, you meet them all the time, the people that think if they get the vaccination, it'll alter their DNA, you know? And I've met some of these people, and they should see this as an opportunity, really. So it's, um, <laughs> it's, um, it's really, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> They, uh, oh my gosh, they, uh, and then maybe it's the places I'm hanging around, but, but there's another group, a subset of that group that thinks we staged the moon landing. I think that's a, that's a great group, and, uh, and, uh, which is crazy because I think we all know that Louis Armstrong walked on the moon, and um, it wasn't Neil Armstrong, it was Louis Armstrong, and uh, he was, uh, uh, it was a big day in New Orleans, hometown kid, but um, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oil and energy thoughts. Um, uh, I think Louisiana is the same situation as, as kind of the central part of Canada. We're big uh, oil and gas producers. But I think the real key here is for people in those areas to realize that we're not energy states or energy countries or energy regions. I mean, we're not oil states. We're energy states. And we have to look at all the different kinds of energy where we have an advantage on. And so if we look at this, on the demand side for oil, Alternative fuels, and they are coming, and this is coming very, very quickly. I talked to a company in Dallas once. He was asking a technology question, and he had an answer for all kinds of technology. He said, you know, I could, I said, when's this going to be developed? And he goes, I'd give you a date, but it's sooner than that. And I thought, that is the answer, really. They just come quicker than you think. So alternative fuels, uh, fuel efficiency in cars, and uh, ride sharing have really cut demand. Most people, uh, even some of the oil executives, think oil demand will peak by 2030. Now, not disappear, but peak. And uh, on the supply side, you've got a lot of oil in Canada. We've got a lot of oil in West Texas shale. Um, and electric cars, you know, 70% of all oil is used for transportation. So you imagine running a business where 70% of your market is eventually gonna, gonna disappear. And that's a, that's a big, big deal. If you take a look, you could, well, if you watch a ball game, right? If you watch a ball game like every other commercial is for an EV. And uh, more importantly, uh, to take an example, 
The U.S. is big on this, Canada is big on this, but Germany came out about three years ago and said that they would no longer make an internal combustion engine by 2030. That is a real shot across the bow. That's VW, BMW, Mercedes. And uh, that really says, uh, says a heck of a lot. So we'll have to see where this all, uh, all, all shakes out. But one of the things you can tell is, for instance, what the oil companies are doing, at least in the U.S., they are drilling in West Texas, which is, I don't know if you've ever been to West Texas, but a lot like Mars, you know, and um, they, it's, uh, you know, God gave them a lot of oil and then had to leave before he got any ponds or trees or anything. It's like, it's like, I've got to be in Santa Barbara. And um, so they, uh, so, but uh, the reason they're drilling those wells is that they're easy to drill, they're pretty cheap, they produce right away, and they produce for about 18 months and then start to fall off. What they're not doing is the commitment here in the Gulf of Mexico where the wells are so much bigger. They produce for 20 or 30 years, but from the time you get that lease from the federal government to the time you drill it and connect it is about somewhere between five and 10 years. So picture it as a business person working for these oil companies saying, I'm gonna spend a billion or $2 billion on this well. And when it come, that oil finally comes, I don't know what it'll be. It's gonna be $3, 200, hard to say. You know, and that's a tough way to do, to, uh, to do, a, uh, do a situation. I will tell you, by the way, one of the reasons I'm so optimistic is households now and corporations are really flush with cash from the, every, all the money that came in during, uh, during the pandemic. So that's gonna make a big difference. That's why we're not gonna see 07 and 08. In 07 and 08, everybody was leveraged to the teeth. And when things began to topple, everybody collapsed. But that's not the balance sheet issue right now. Um, it's the rise of electric cars. We are at the, uh, the part, I guess the S curve is what they call it, or the tipping point. We're almost there. And you know the way capitalism works. You're gonna go to bed on Tuesday night, and there's not gonna be a single charging station, and wake up Wednesday morning and there's gonna be one on every corner. That's the way capitalism works. It has its faults, but that, it does work quickly. Um, there's a big distinction between uh, you know, what is used for transportation and what is used for electricity. We are going to need, the whole world's going to need a ton of electricity. There's no question. It's just going to grow and grow and grow. And wait till we start plugging in electric cars to the house. That's going to be unbelievable. But oil doesn't create electricity. Electricity is der uh, derived by a natural gas, coal, solar, and wind. And both the U.S. and Canada have huge um, uh, storages of natural gas, a huge amount uh, to, bring, to bring to the surface. But planes, trains, and automobiles are run almost entirely by oil. So they have two very different uh, kinds of look. Natural gas is now the largest of all the fuel sources for electricity. We also have to do, oh, about a zillion dollars to improving the grid. You know, it is just, <laughs> you know, it's very, we're very vulnerable at, the, at this point. New Orleans, the power goes out about every day is, um, I don't know what that's about, but it's, uh, it's uh, um, if you know, I think coal has had it. Um, sometimes you get a little hint. This is the coal museum in Louisville, Kentucky is now powered by solar. So um, <laughs> uh, every once in a while you think, oh, that's, that's what's he saying? And um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is where we think electricity will come from by fuel. Everybody will differ on the numbers, but the trend is right, that coal will be used less, nuclear will be used less, uh, renewables, will, on, at least on a percentage basis, will get much higher, and natural gas will go, and it's probably in there for 20 or 30 years of being a primary, uh, primary fuel source. You know, being a public speaker is a really weird job, uh, and like I said, it's so great to be home. Uh, but it's very weird because you never meet the other speakers. Uh, they kind of go like that, that great woman before me. That was an amazing talk. Um, but I'll never meet her. And, um, and so you're kind of like a lone, lone wolf by yourself there. And you meet a lot of great people. But um, I was uh, a speaker. I was in Orlando and I was in backstage. And I met one of the speakers that was coming on. And I never get to do that. And we started uh, j laughing and telling war stories. And he was telling me about a friend of his that took an engagement in North Dakota in February. And so I, I guess he really needed the money. And, um, and so, so, he, uh, so he, takes, he flies up there, the plane ride's pretty good, and it's not 50 below, it's like 10 above. And, and then he goes to the hotel and he has dinner and then he goes to sleep. And overnight, about two, two and a half feet of snow fall. And so when he wakes up, he puts a suit on, goes to the lobby, and there's nobody there because nobody can get to the, the conference, to the hotel. And so he sees the guy running it, and he says, um, 
geez, what do I do? There's nobody here. And the guy says, you know, actually, we already paid you. And, um, and uh, uh, you know, and, and it is videotaped, so I'd like to see you make the speech. So he goes, all right. So he gets up, there's 400 seats. There's not a soul there. And he, <laughs> and he tries to get his game face on and do it. But way over in the corner, there's one guy and he's taking notes and he's clapping and he's establishing eye contact. <laughs> So, so at the end of the, the end of the speech, he goes over to me. He goes, "I can't thank you enough. This would have been unbearable without you. I, I really appreciate it. What brings you here today?" And he goes, "I'm the next speaker." So it's a, <laughs> the, uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a, oh my gosh. So the, uh, <laughs> oh man, man, oh man, the. Uh, Let's see where we are now. Oh, this is what I wanted to tell you is the most exciting thing in energy, and it comes, source-wise, it comes, a lot of it comes from Canada, and that is LNG, liquefied natural gas. And what they do is, for instance, in the U.S. and Canada, you can get natural gas for about $5 a thousand cubic feet. It's one of the cheapest in the world. And what they do is they send pipelines, and they go down everywhere, but a lot of it goes to Lake Charles, Louisiana, which is about two and a half hours southwest of us, which seems metaphysical because we're in the swamp. And um, so it's, uh, it's like, where are we? So, um, uh, the, uh, but it's the, what else? So they ship it down to Lake Charles and Lake Charles, they freeze the natural gas. They drop it to 265 degrees below zero, which I was told earlier is colder than Winnipeg, which is, I didn't, I didn't so that's my new reference. As, um, and when they do that, it sh shrinks the natural gas into one six hundredth of its size, so it's really squished. And they put them on these ships, and engineering-wise, that's a great marvel and all that, but that's not why business does things. The reason they do it is arbitrage. They can get gas for $5 a thousand cubic feet, heat it, ship it, and then send it to, in Europe, they get $25 a thousand cubic feet for it. And in Asia, they get $20 a thousand cubic feet. This is amazing arbitrage. And so now they're building out this business like crazy. In fact, they don't even call them vessels anymore. They call them trains because they just want one after the other. The lanyap, that's a Louisiana term. It's a Creole term, meaning a little something extra. The lanyap here is that it's kind of helping out uh, uh, Europe with the cutoff in gas by Russia. Now, not enough, but we are able to get natural gas into those countries. That, once again, not why it was created, but it is helping a bit. Um, the stock market, a lot of people think the stock market is the economy. It's not. The stock market's not the economy. Um, the stock market doesn't care if you're happy or employed or married. They don't care anything. They, what they care about is a measure of future corporate profits. That's what they're estimating. And so generally, the stock market isn't the economy, but it's usually about six to nine months ahead of the economy. So we do get to see, um, we do, do get to see some sort of uh, predictive power uh, in the stock market. Um, another thing is important math is if you take a big hit in a stock, and this year we've had a few stocks that have taken big hits, including mine, and um, if the market, let's, let's do it this way, if a stock's at $20 a share and it drops to 10, that's a 50% drop. But in order to get the stock back from 10 to 20, you need a 100% increase. And that's the hole you dig yourself in. So it's, a, it's just one of the things that makes, uh, makes investing uh, so difficult. And by the way, it's so good that your trustees, I sometimes speak to groups and they have no idea how these markets work. I had one guy at the end of my speech, he came up to me and he said, Peter, I really enjoyed your talk, but it didn't, uh, it didn't relate to me personally because um, you were all talking about stocks and, uh, and my money's in mutual funds. It was like, ah, this, um, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, I didn't thought mutual funds, I guess, were made of cheese. I don't know what they, um, <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell them. So, um, they, um, the other thing that happens is you've got to swim against the tide. It's always the way to make money. If you're all going in the same direction, you're not going to get anywhere. Like I know when I go to a, a cocktail party or a crawfish boil and people are coming up telling me they own a specific stock, um, I go home and sell it. And um, because <laughs> it's, uh, and of course in the last two years, all you've heard about is crypto, Bitcoin, uh, weed stocks, you know, it's a, and you know it was too late for all of that. Um, and I remember when I was 22 years old and I got out of college, I was at an investment firm in Boston and an older guy pulled me aside who I now think in retrospect was like 26. But, um, <laughs> but, he, uh, but he's, he said to me something kind of profound. He said, if a majority of the people were right, a majority of the people would be rich and they're not. And I've always remembered that. In fact, I, have, I have, actually have that tattooed in my left buttocks. It's a very, 
I did not want to forget that. And, um, and I wrote it off on taxes that year, which is still kind of a debate with the IRS. But it's, um, they, uh, it's an investment cost. And um, so if you look at it, it is true. In the 1990s, two-thirds of Americans felt the country was on the wrong track. And the 90s was a great time to invest. In 2000, 80% of Americans believed the country was on the right track. And we went into the lost decade. In 2010, just coming out of the 08, 09 uh, recession, uh, recession depression, nearly everyone thought the country was on the wrong track and the market soared. And right now, 70% of Americans believe we're going in the wrong direction. And that is great news. That is, um, <laughs> that is that's the way it works. So we, we, have, to, we have to listen. Um, uh, the other thing that's pretty encouraging about the market is there's a, still a lot of cash held by money managers on the sideline. Now, I'll tell you something. You know this as trustees, but the only way really to get fired as a money manager is to have too much cash and the market goes up without you. So that money, and once we start to get the market, uh, get its feet back, that money's got to come back into the, uh, into the market.